Hey guys, welcome to another video. I thought I would take some time out from some coloring to focus on knitting again. Um, I woke up this morning thinking that this might be fun for some people to look at. Uh, I now have the two volumes that were published by Anne Bar Bardsgard, um, where she had documented all of the Selbu patterns for mittens and socks. And because the one for socks just came out in English, relatively recently, I thought I would just go ahead and focus on this one in particular. And I just wanted to show you the cover first so you can see um, that that was the book. And um, I bought this because I just want to collect all of the patterns for a pattern library. So if I want to design my own knitwear, there's all of these charted designs. And that's what this book is for. Uh, I treated this to myself for my birthday last year in November and um, I bought it from Schoolhouse Press and I'll just kind of walk you through uh, a brief uh, bit of it. Obviously the publisher doesn't want me to show you everything because then you may not want to buy the book, but I think people need to kind of see what's in the book before they decide whether they want to buy the book because it is very, very expensive. So you can see a lot of photos in the beginning um, of the historic knitwear that has been preserved over time. And I actually have a book with a pattern on how to make this one in particular. Um, but you can see these vintage photos where people went skiing with these sweaters. And what makes this so meaningful to me is that I grew up in Michigan and my grandmother grew up making these exact sweaters for my my mom and my dad that they wore on ski trips so I just grew up with this as a part of my life and that the whole Scandinavian influence in the upper Midwest I definitely grew up with that in Michigan as a child and so there's a lot of nostalgia for me and seeing these sweaters and it was sort of partly why I'm so in love with Fair Isle knitting um, so Unfortunately, what I ended up finding out with this book is that a lot of the repeat patterns, because they're meant for a leg, potentially I could see that being used for an arm, uh, they don't exactly fit perfectly for knitting hats, which is what I like to do. It, I just live in a warm weather climate where it'd be too hot to be knitting and wearing sweaters all the time. So especially with the kind of wool that you need to used to um, do steaking where you would just cut the fabric, uh, knit the fabric in a, in a tube and then cut it um, rather than seaming it. So anyways, I just, I always love to educate myself in the historical parts of, of this um, cultural um, phenomenon. And so the book offers a lot of fun uh, historical information. And then there's some technical information in the book on how to center a pattern, for example, and how to um, choose appropriate uh, patterns for what you want to do, what patterns work best for what parts of the garment. And here there's some basic, basic, basic construction techniques for each part of the garment. Um, and then it just goes straight into uh, actual designs and so here they're saying these designs would be appropriate for what they're calling a fitted guarded cardigan. Uh, here's what they're showing for a short jacket, for example. And so basically what you would have to do is just look at this for ins inspiration, look at what the pattern repeats are, and see if it would fit into your own design. So what I realized after studying these charted designs is that um, they're very, uh, I don't want to say the word pixelated, but they're very, extremely symmetrical, very, very symmetrical and very, very repetitive. And I get bored with that. And, um, what, after studying Marie Wallen's patterns, uh, you can see that she probably uses reference books like this as a starting point, but she will just, uh, go on to produce very unique designs that I don't see in these historical books with charted pattern references. So for me, if I were to design my own garment, 
I would want to follow the path of Marie Wallen and just get out a computer software program that allowed me to just play around with charted designs until I was able to manipulate them into something that was unique and original, not just a straight copy from a book like this. So a pattern like this would be fantastic uh, for people that had to knit for a living. They didn't have to study a chart. They could memorize it and quickly produce something like this. And just for sheer survival in the winter to keep your family warm, that made a lot of sense. But for someone who's just knitting for a hobby, you know, I would get too bored with a pattern like that. So I'll just uh, kind of quickly um, show you how, so I'm assuming nobody's going to be able to steal these patterns just by looking at this video in case people are worried. Um, and sorry, this, I need to lower this so you can see the whole thing. I've got this on my easel because um, I'm trying to uh, not have to hold it, which is kind of causing pain for me. I have this chronic pain condition, so um, I'm always trying to figure out ways to be more ergonomic with things that I do. Um, and I'm trying to film this with my iPad <laughs> uh, on a little uh, device here. So I love these hats, and um, to me this reminds me of what I've heard some people on Ravelry refer to as a Pope hat, where it's made in four wedges, and. You almost have to go with this kind of hat design if you're using a big uh, motif that you want to repeat four times and the trade-off is that you're not going to have a round hat and it will not necessarily be something like what we would call a beanie hat that would be perfectly round because these areas are going to poke out somewhat you can't tell when it's laying flat like that for the photograph but um, this uh, hat, um, I've only seen one pattern on Ravelry. Um, uh, the name, uh, the brand name that the designer goes by is Berger, Berger, Berger. And uh, I knit his hat and I'll show that in another video. And let me tell you, you have to really know what you're doing to chart out a design like this in order to get it to go into a, a round shape like this and that is one of the biggest challenges of designing hats it's a lot easier in some ways to design a sweater because it's flat of course you have to deal with the arms but this is a completely rounded shape uh, and so there's a lot of different things that have to go into your charting to make it all work because you're having to decrease in pattern up to the top so um, that if you're trying to challenge yourself technically that is a, a really fun, stimulating exercise. Um, I love this baby hat. I think that is so sweet. Can you imagine? Somebody had made and gifted that to somebody. Um, and um, so there's actually a pattern for making that in here. And I'm wondering if it's showing up on Ravelry, if anybody's attempted to make that. Um, I don't know how accurate these patterns are. I haven't tested it, knitted them, and I'm not really sure um, what, uh, you know, whether the, even if the English language translation uh, is, uh, you know, accurate. It's uh, what I do anytime I get a pattern is I will read through it thoroughly and try to find the errors. And then I will look up pattern corrections online. And then once I'm convinced that the math is perfect. I, I won't start knitting until I, because I've run into so many patterns where there are so many problems and it's impossible to understand certain sections of the patterns. And I don't want to get invested in yarn and only to get stuck and frustrated and, and not know how to figure out how to finish that. That has happened too many times for me now to not trust any pattern whatsoever. Um, the, the industry today there's a lot of indie knitters that do have test knitters, but my impression is that these test knitters are a little afraid to point out the errors because um, they want to keep getting the ability to keep doing test knitting so that they can do the pattern with the, the yarn at the time that all of it is released early to them. And f so for some reason, it just feels like test knitters don't always have the ability to feel free to communicate all the errors and then they don't end up getting incorporated into the final pattern. I'm not saying everybody, this happens for everybody, but I've seen, I've seen it. 
Um, so uh, here's, uh, this is a really interesting sweater with a gigantic selbu uh, motif covering the entire sweater. <laughs> the issue I have with patterns like this is that, um, do you see the rippling here? So it's gonna be almost impossible to get the sweater to uh, knit uh, in a nice even fabric because the color work here is gonna be a different gauge than the plain knitting here. And for all the uh, women in Scandinavia that can pull that off, I, I just, um, they do it by changing needle sizes or controlling their gauge by switching how firmly or loosely they knit. And I'm sure if you grew up doing this over, over, over years and years, it becomes very natural to you. But for me, it's just not something I've, I've been able to figure out or learn how to do. Um, so not sure how much more to kind of share. Um, but I just, I wanted to give people the ability to look inside the book and, and see what's in here and just give you a chance to kind of decide, gosh, should I buy this book? Um, I love these animal uh, motifs and um, I've always wanted to uh, do some knitting with little bunnies in it, which I do have charted designs for. But this is a good example of where you have to really know how to be in control of your gauge because there's large sections of the pattern where there is no color work in between each design. And I, I want to say, it, in a sense, it's almost like intarsia. It's not knitted in the intarsia method, but you have big areas where there's no color work. And so you're going to have very uneven fabric unless you can control your tension in some way. And also let me tell you that knitting with black and white can be really, really challenging because the black can show through behind the white. So if anybody's gonna do just a pure black and white design, I highly recommend doing a lot of swatching with the with just only buy two skeins of yarn and then do a lot of swatching with your pattern and see if you're happy with the results before you, you buy enough yarn to commit to a whole sweater like that. Um, I, I've read in Elizabeth Zimmerman books that um, the more you wash and wear a sweater, the more tightly um, the stitches hug to one another and any kind of wonkiness that may show up after it's first knitted eventually disappears over time. So that's something else to kind of think about. But what a masterpiece, this cute little sweater here. And it was probably hardly ever worn because what a great condition it's still in. Um, so, um, let's see. So, isn't that neat? So, there's tons of charted designs in here for those types of patterns. And now we're kind of getting into um, uh, pattern repeats for, for cardigans. Um, and they kind of show you uh, ways in which you can uh, incorporate them into a sweater design. To me, this kind of sweater reminds me of the Dale of Norway uh, designs that came out in the 80s when they were designing sweaters for the Norwegian ski team. And I have a lot of those vintage patterns. And uh, one day I was thinking of actually showing them to people because they're not for sale any longer. And I think this seems like I would much rather have a zipper front sweater with a collar like that than the types of pullovers we see today with the um, crew neck collar. That's, I can't stand anything closer on my neck. I feel like it's going to seem scratchy and just make me feel like it's picky and scratchy on that area of my body. I wouldn't want it up close to my neck, but I don't live in a freezing cold climate. So, uh, I would, you know, if you live in the winter where you def it's a necessity, then I would imagine you'd have a totally different reaction than I have to those kind of sweaters. So one thing uh, you'll see in patterns, if books where there's vintage uh, patterns or designs, a lot of the sweaters were very high waisted um, uh, in the like in the 20s and 30s and 40s, and so feminine and so beautiful and such a contrast to the uh, extra long boxy sweaters. Uh, 
that so many vintage patterns have from the 80s. Um, so um, I want to say these are uh, patterns for the sides of socks. I'm not quite sure, but in the mitten book, there's a lot of patterns like that for doing the sides of the mittens. So it's a certain type of um, pattern repeat that you want to put into. Um, okay, so I guess basically here it's just pattern repeats for the length of the sock. Can you see this uh, section here on the side? I'm guessing, oh, sorry, those patterns are for this section of the sock. I read this book when I first got it and then I, it's been sitting on my bookshelf for a while. So I haven't, I, I don't remember exactly what each section of the book is. I'm just guessing. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't read it before I did this video. I just wanted to put this out there because everybody's, in, you know, trying not to go outside. I'm hoping to do some videos so in case people are getting bored, I can contribute something to YouTube for content for people who are just struggling to get through the day like I am. This reminds me <clears throat> of the Bajas <clears throat> knitting and it looks very geometric and very modern and I just find that so interesting um, that this is a vintage Norwegian design and how much that shows you how much influence there was uh, between the designers in the different countries. Um, so, um, I just find women like this so amazing, um, how hard their lives were, and, um, she's still smiling, and that just fills me with so much gratitude that, you know, she contributed to the foundation of the country that we know as Norway today, and, endured so many hardships and yet she found a way to create something that was warm and decorative that made her feel happy and proud and I just I just admire these photos just warm my heart so much I'm so so grateful to be able to see them so these are again more pattern repeats this is a very pa common pattern repeat I just see it everywhere um, it's commonly used by American designers that um, tend to do uh, less complex patterns. Um, so this, so basically here we're getting into charted designs that can go down the length of the leg. And because these are historic, uh, my, um, my overall impression from all the reading I've done, um, just concluding that these were very repetitive, symmetrical designs that could be easily memorized. So when people were knitting at the end of a long day in front of a fireplace, or they were knitting um, while they were standing and walking or whatever the case was, this was something they could do without having to constantly have to refer to a chart. So um, for me, I, if I'm just doing this as a hobby, as I was saying earlier, I would get bored. So what I would want to do is maybe find a similar, uh, find another pattern with the same repeat and maybe break this up and put different uh, motifs in or just play around with this so it's not so symmetrical. I'm a huge fan of symmetry, but if I have to knit this, you know, over a period of, of weeks, I don't think I'd ever finish it because it would just become too monotonous for me. But if I had to be walking through a field to get from place A to B that took an hour, then that is a perfect design for that uh, situation. Um, and if what I just said offended people, I'm not meaning to be offensive. I'm just giving you my personal reaction to my thoughts about these designs. They're gorgeous. They're amazing. And these are the women that were the pioneers that started it all. And there's nothing but... Uh, admiration that I have for everything that they did and everything that they accomplished. Um, I'm just speaking from the perspective of how could I use this design to incorporate into a pattern to make myself something that would be enjoyable to knit. Um, this is uh, really exciting to me, a pattern like this, but um, it's very difficult to get a pattern like this to um, keep maintain gauge. There's a lot of complexity there, and it's really wonderful that 
they're showing you what the sweater actually looks like when it's knit out because it can be very deceiving to look at a pattern and think you're going to see exactly that in the knitted fabric and it may not look exactly like that and it, a lot of it has to do with the gauge of yarn you're using and how well you're knitting but in this case you can see there's a very fairly good correspondence between the pattern and the actual knitted fabric but it doesn't always work out that way so we're extra lucky that they show you what it looks like in the finished garment it definitely looks way bigger the motif looks way bigger on the sweater than it does on the page um, see how she's standing and knitting <laughs> um, these women were so talented they put all modern women to shame um, how they had to live their lives and what they had to do in the physical uh, the level of physicality that was required to just get through each day is mind-blowing to me. Um, so, um, it's another really, really beautiful pattern. Um, it's short-waisted. So, here we have um, the pattern uh, repeats just represented here graphically and then here charted out. So, this is the real beauty of this book is you've got these charted designs, you can refer to them and you can incorporate them into your own uh, garment. And um, look at those socks, aren't they so sweet? <sighs> so let me just um, kind of flip through the rest of the book. Um, so this video doesn't go on forever. Sometimes the backs of these books have graph knitting graph paper, uh, but I, don't, I guess this one doesn't. Um, so I'll just kind of go like this now, so that you can uh, you can see the, the sheer volume of patterns and lots of examples of. Uh, vintage sweaters. One thing that you have to do is figure out where the pattern repeat is and then isolate that uh, so that when you're designing, um, if you want to do a charted design where you're just isolating just the pattern repeats of Paolo, that's something else that you have to keep in mind. Um, this book wasn't organized with pattern repeats that um, uh, uh, differ by repeat uh, length. For example, like a 24 stitch repeat or a 36 stitch repeat. Um, and all of the charted designs um, are charted out with the assumption that you're going to be making a sock. Of course, this is the book. These are the charted designs found in the vintage patterns for socks. Um, so the trick is how to figure out how to use them for other garments. But they do, they do give you examples of how um, they could be used in sweaters and, and socks. Um, sorry, I, my, I'm trying to film this with the iPad in front of me and it keeps jiggling because my hand is bumping up against the little uh, gooseneck stand that it's mounted on. So, um, just such an elegant photo, uh, just so beautiful. Um, the fact that people knit after an exhausting uh, period of daily chores and kept themselves busy constantly with no idle time, that these garments were made when they were resting is just also mind blowing to me. But I could see how Knitting could be relaxing and soothing, even if you're really tired. I just, um, sometimes if I'm really tired, there's no way I could just sit and knit. Um, these designs I get really excited about, these all over uh, designs, but they're a lot harder to incorporate into uh, the construction of garments. Um, you can see her socks there and his sweater. I'm sure someone from Norway could provide a much more meaningful 
review of this book. I'm just an American that hasn't lived in Norway, doesn't speak the language, and um, so I apologize to anyone from Norway who may listen to me and think, oh, the Americans. I, I, I've i never been to Scandinavia, and um, I follow a lot of people on Instagram um, from uh, Norway and Iceland who do fabulous knitting, but you don't really get to socialize or really get to know people or learn from them in social media. I, I love that sweater. It's so pretty. Oh, that is just so pretty. Um, so I guess I should probably stop for now. Um, I'm hoping that uh, this gives you a sense for what's inside the book and it inspires you to uh, either buy the book or uh, at least know that you had the opportunity to decide for yourself whether you think this was worth the investment, whether you think you want to own something like this. And um, I don't think it's going to be around forever. I do think once it goes out of print, it'll end up showing up on Amazon or eBay for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So whenever these things come out, I try to just get them while they're there, just because I know one day I may regret not having it. And then if I never end up using it, um, I'll make sure it goes to a library where other people can rent it out and just use it um, without having to pay for it. Um, so that's the, the end of my review. Thanks for watching, you guys. I have lots of plans for a lot of other videos to share that I'll be working on today. I hope you are having a wonderful Friday, or if you're in, heading into the weekend, hopefully you'll find something really cool to do that the weather is gonna be okay for you where you live and that uh, everybody's hanging in there. Um, I will talk to you on the next video.